under the teaching structure of the Government of 12. So uh, this is your training. And those of you that are not a member of this church and you're just watching, this will give you a real in-depth uh, understanding of uh, the Government of 12. There was 12 tribes, 12 apostles. You see the structure in the Old Testament. You see it in the New Testament. So anyway, we're going uh, to start with the church, the body. Uh, what, is, what is the church? The church is made uh, or it's divided into two parts. You have people that are members of the body of Christ. You know, you first get saved and so forth. And then you have the leadership. So basically... What you have in the Bible is that we're many, but we're one body. Amen? But then you go into uh, what we call the two parts, which is the membership, okay? Meaning you become a part of the family. And then you have number two, which is leadership. So we're going to be covering those two, um, you know, areas. Um, honey, could you, um, could you read uh, Romans 12, uh, verses uh, 4 and 5? So we're going to be on uh, membership. You become a member of the body of Christ. Now, how many of you guys have, ever, uh, have seen a, a military movie? Not been in the military, but you've seen a military movie, okay? Have you noticed that they have uniforms? Okay, the reason they have uniforms and the reason that they have ranks is to know if you're all wearing the same uniform, that means you're a member of the same army. Mm -hmm. Got it? But then everybody goes through what? Boot camp, correct? Mm -hmm. There's no such thing as you, don't, you do not go through boot camp. But everybody starts as going, it is the start by going through boot camp. Everybody starts by being born again, by being a part of the family. God adopts you, now you are his child. So everybody starts like that. After that comes the second phase, which is leadership. You start maturing instantly. As soon as you take your oath, amen. Now you're a member of the armed forces and you just matured. Just by saying the oath. When you pay attention to what's coming out of your mouth, you go, oh boy. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You're promising to uphold the Constitution of the United States of America. How? With my blood if I have to. You get it? So that's the entrance. Then you move into ranks and so forth, into leadership. So now we're going to go ahead and, and we're going to cover when you become a, a member of the family. Amen? Amen. When a child is born in the hospital, he automatically gets a parent's what? Name. They just became a part of the family. When you're born again, you automatically become a part of the family. You become a Christian. Does, uh, do you guys know where the word Christian came from? Well, I know a lot of you do. Okay? It means little Jesuses, little anointed ones. That's what it means. And we did not name ourselves that. Okay? This first started in the church, the great church of Antioch. And in Antioch was the first place that they started calling us Christians. We didn't name ourselves. People that were not Christians named us Christians. Why did they name us Christians? Because they saw little Jesuses. Christ, Christian. Did you get it? All right. So let's start with the first step. A step. You're a part of the family. Okay? So here we are. You're a part of the family. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we being many, 
are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. So we're different, different backgrounds, different this, but we are all one member of the what? Of the body. Can I ask yourself, can you ask yourself this question? How does my body function? First of all, is it attached to itself? Notice that my finger is not in the front row sitting down, and I'm over here. But it's, it signifies unity and so forth. You guys get that. Okay, so we are supposed to be one. That's why he used the word one body. Did you get that? One body. That's the unity that we're supposed to have. Okay? That's the unity that we're, we're supposed to have. Period. Have you noticed that under pressure, your body starts to disjoin itself from uh, the other members? Uh, I'm going to give you an example. I remember um, when I was sent to this um, uh, boys' school, when I got in trouble when I was a young man, I decided to go out for track. I didn't know what it involved. Got it? And the coach went out there and we started running. And running, and running, and running. <laughs> and my mind was going, you know, I want to be a member of the track team. My lungs were saying, I don't want to be a member <laughs> of the track team. And I remember I started hyperventilating. Did you get that? That means that you get, you're getting more oxygen than what you need. You start getting dizzy. You can't breathe. And they actually have to take a, what they do is they'll take a bag, a paper bag or a plastic bag, and they put it over your face so you're rebreathing what you're, so you're not taking new what? Oxygen. New oxygen because literally it's like you start getting drunk. You just, did you get that? So I had a, a split decision. Got it? In my mind, I'm going to, my nickname is going to be Jumping Jack Flash. And my lungs are going, hot air. <laughs> Did you get it? So when situations happen in a church, and with you guys with one another, under stressful situation you're going to have the same problem that my lungs have with my mind. But just work it out together. There has to be... How many of you know that my mind had to say, you know what, Jose, you better really slow down. Then it was, you better walk. You better get that bag that the coach is handing you and put it over your face. So there have to be adjustments. Obviously, I didn't die because I'm here today. Everything went back to working what? Together. So when you have problems, well, the part of the body has a problem with the other, work it out together. And, and your paper bag is the word of God. Yeah. Just remember, you know, you do not sit there and go, I'm cutting my lungs out. I've had it with these lungs. Or the lung says, you know what? Uh, I'm going to just separate myself from the brain. You got it? So we're all part of what? One body. One body. One body. Can you guys say that? We're all part of what? One That's body. right. And those of you on the internet, you're all part of what? One. Go body. ahead, say it for them. One body. That's one right. Body. So if you're not one body, you'll never get anything done. You can say, I'm a prophet. I'm in a ministry that helps, or I'm this or I'm that. You don't work together? Watch. Close your eyes. Run across, run around the sanctuary ten times. You're going to have a problem. You get it? Okay. 
Now, I'm going to really listen to this teaching, but I want you to cover your ears. Oh. <laughs> Mm-mm. You get it? So it's really important that we are one body. Mm -hmm. I mean, period. So, honey, can you read that real slow one more time? For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office. So we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. There it is. Yeah, we are. Okay, now we're going to move into the second phase, which is uh, leadership. Okay? Leadership. So, uh, honey, go ahead and, uh, uh, why don't you, yeah, why don't you, this is Hebrews 13, verse 17. Is there such thing as leadership? I, I want to ask you guys a question. Okay, are you ready? Remember we started talking about when you're in the military, you what? You have a uniform. Correct? And when you have that uniform, and you have gunnery sergeant markings on you, you are a gunnery what? Sergeant. Now, so we all know, and it makes perfect sense to us, that if we were all to join the army right now, that we, will not, we would not start out as generals. Amen? You would be insane, correct? If you were to say, um, uh, thank you for that uniform, but I need... Uh, I, I need all the stars. Uh, you might as well make them four. A four-star general. Now, isn't that easy? I mean, we go, well, that's, that makes sense. Of course you don't start out as a general. In the body of Christ, a lot of people will join and they demand a four-star situation. Got it? Because they might be really smart mm -hmm. in the world, or let's say they might be really intelligent. They might be a millionaire. And they think that automatically because they're a billionaire, mm -hmm. you come into the body of Christ and... Oh, wait a minute, you just can't hand me the, the uniform of a private. I need four stars. Did you get that? When I, I, every once in a while, I'm required to wear uh, a different type of outfit. Now, I dress just like everybody else. But it will amaze you when I end up putting a high collar on, a clergy outfit, it amazes me how people treat me different. You don't want to know why? I have a uniform on. Where somebody might say, hey, bro, <laughs> they'll say, uh, it depends what background they're from, how are you, Father? <laughs> or, or reverent. And then I take it off and it's, yo, what's up? <laughs> you want a toot zero pop? <laughs> Can you lick it without chewing and getting the chocolate? You know. We're going into leadership now. Got it? And remember, you're going through the government of 12. We're studying these things, and you're maturing and so forth. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't matter how talented you are. You might be the number one movie star in Hollywood. When you come into the family of God, you are not born with a beard. Got it? And a corn pipe. You might do that when you grow a little bit. You get it? But not when you first start. No different. You don't start out with four stars. How do I know that? That's it. You know, I, 
I had to go through things. I had to go through training and, uh, you know, and so forth. You know, I, I used to wonder about leadership. And I, I remember I said, um, I wonder if I could give my life for Christ. And I did a little study on the leaders that were martyred. Come to find out that uh, one of the little codes and signs that they had during the early church was a rose. Okay? A rose represented martism, a red rose. That means, you know, if that mark appeared where you were buried, that means that you were a martyr. You just didn't die. You were a martyr. That was very interesting. And, uh, you know, after some years went by, I got a chance to find out. You know what I'm saying? I got to find out. Just like Peter had to, you know, found out too. But leadership takes you to a, uh, a unique place of sacrifice. Amen? Yep. All right. So go ahead, honey. Hebrews thirteen seventeen, Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls as they that must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. Go ahead. Honey. You want more? No. Okay. Um, do you want to say anything no, about that? You go ahead. Um, can, uh, can you do me a favor, Raymond? Could you please bring me the picture of uh, Lizzie Jasper? Now, when I first got saved, my first experience with leadership in the body of Christ was, guess who the Lord had as my mentor? My grandma. It doesn't get any more dis discipline, it doesn't disciplinary than this. The pastor's wife. I mean, not, pa excuse me, not the pastor's yeah. wife. The pastor's mother. Well, you can have a disagreement with the pastor. Remember her? You know, you can have a disagreement with the pastor, right? Mm -hmm. But you don't have a disagreement with the pastor's mother. This is holy ground. You want to you wanna get in trouble, you be disrespectful to the pastor's mother. which had built so many churches, I don't even remember. Which had trained the pastor. Got it? And I had come out of a motorcycle gang background. In a motorcycle um, gang environment, women are a piece of property. Do you know what's tattooed on women? Property of, and then the name of the club. So guess what I needed? A woman. A woman. Here's Grandma. this old lady, she you know, that knitted things. It, could be, it couldn't be more of a nightmare to my flesh. <laughs> you know, on top of everything, she, the woman knit. So I'm going to have to listen and I'm going to be mentored by somebody that knits little sweaters. and she, Yeah, she did the whole thing, crochet. I come from a motorcycle gang background. What is God trying to do to me? Make me understand leadership. Did you get that? And uh, uh, she surprised me. She read, you know that verse we just read? Mm -hmm. She let us know that we're going to stand in front of the Almighty in the future. And you better hope that when I do it, I do it joyfully. <laughs> you better hope that I don't go, oh, that one. 
Lord, that guy was a royal pain. <laughs> you got it? In her last, uh, uh, the last part, this was the introduction to the minister's class. She says, I want you to know that I'm going to find out who's really called to the ministry or not. How am I going to do that? You're going to find out. But I'm going to find out quickly because I'm getting ready to go home to be with the Lord. I'm, I'm older. And I don't have time to waste. So I'm going to find out if you're called to the ministry or not real quick because I don't have time to waste. And I said to myself, With her little knitting deal, I would have never expected those harsh, cruel words to come and hurt me. An ex-biker, dude. I found out about, you know, leadership. But when you are leaders, and some of you are leaders, mm -hmm. there's a verse that's not taught very much in the church because it's, not popular enough. It's not, you know, uffy fluffy enough. But I'm going to tell you something. Those of you that are in leadership and so forth, when you stand before Almighty God, after the Lord gets done talking about your personal life, then there's going to be a conversation about other people. And I want you to read that verse one more time. Um, obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves for they watch for your souls as they that must give account that they may do it with joy and not with grief for that is unprofitable for you. Unprofitable is not good. You know what's fantastic about us men? Well, you know, my wife is supposed to submit to me. I'm the head of the household. <laughs> I'm the head of the household. But the usher will tell you, excuse me, could you move over one share so we can have enough for this? And you get upset, and you're a man. But you're expecting your wife to submit to you. She'll never submit to you. Because guess what? You reap what you sow. You didn't submit to anybody in the church. But my wife, I'm the head of this household, and my wife's supposed to submit to me. Really? <laughs> really? You guys are going to train one another in leadership because most people think that, well, if you even get to this phase, that person is a leader, you know, a pastor, whatever. But we forget that. And guess where training for leadership really starts? One another. Could you please do this for me? Nope. You know what I'm saying? In your household, in the church. I, I, of course, if a general walks in, everybody's going to salute and act a certain way. But what if it isn't a general? You know what I'm saying? What if it isn't? What if it's just somebody from the church? Doesn't even have a position. Got it? And they ask you to, to, to please do something. I didn't do that for my mom, and I sure ain't going to do it for this person. You know what I'm saying? So don't, don't limit the training to just one individual. You, you know what I'm saying? Glory to God. So what I wanted to say is that um, 
on this scripture is that I'm really happy that the young people are here. And when I say young people, the young married couples and those that are single and your generation. And the reason is because in the time that, that I, you know, got saved and everything is that, and, and this woman had great influence over my life also. And um, I have seen that as generations have gone on, people have lost respect for the things of the Lord. They've lost respect for the people in the house, you know, in the home, respect for um, the, the calling of God on, on an individual. And, and so I was talking to Jose and I said, I am so happy that we are teaching this so the younger generation can see that this is the respect because I respect, oh, I respect my husband for one. And then those that come into the calls of God in their life, I respect the call of God in their, in their life. And we have to have, the, the Word of God even says that we have to submit one to another. And that means not ordering each other. That means respecting each other. Like we respect Sherry, who is in a intercessory and counsel and all of those things. So we have to have that respect. And the church has lost that. And the church is getting it back we are calling it back and decreeing it back into the body of Christ so that we can be in such unity and we can give a joyful account to people. Like right now, if, we, if everything ended, I'd be like, I am giving such a joyful count to uh, Corey and Autumn and and Gloriana, I mean, I'm giving this joyful account and the things on these young people that God has used, you know, Nick, Mariana, and there's a joyful account, you know, and that we're giving to these younger generation that God has called them in. And we're giving a joyful account. So that's what I want to kind of stress is that don't look at that as, oh, I got to obey them. That, that's not what it means. I mean, well, it does, you know. But the generals, you know, that come into our life. This woman was an example. She had the power of God in her life. And, it, and she watched after our souls. And that's what you have to understand is what our job is in leadership is to watch for your soul. We are watching for your soul and giving an account to the Lord. And, you know, um, is it okay if I share this? Oh, so watching for your soul, it's kind of like a mama bird up on top of the cage. And she's looking down the path and she sees the little birds coming and there's a big cat there. And she knows that cat is going to get that. So she is warning. She's watching for them. And that's kind of what we do is that we are watching for your souls to give account for it. Hey, there's a problem coming down the road. So it's up to the little birds to listen. <laughs> so, you know, leadership, uh, I'm telling you, um, I remember when I first went into the minister's, you know, class, and I heard, you know, Grandma Jasper's little speech, and all of a sudden, um, this is the first time that I was going out. She set up the meeting. We got there. Um... It wasn't a 10,000 people auditorium. To this day, it's the poorest church that I've ever been to in my life. And um, 
I remember walking in and one of the young men, after grandma had, you know, walked to the other end of the church, he comes up and he says, you're being mentored by Lizzie Jasper? And I said, and he says, wow. And me, I'm going, what's the big deal? I mean, I know she's a tough old bird. <laughs> Mama bird. I'd never told her that, but tough old bird. <laughs> and she said, man, you know what happened to our, uh, to our pastor here, don't you? And I go, no. And he goes, well, our current pastor was mistreating the church and the people, mistreating us. And he said, and, uh, and Lissy Jasper came. And she got up to, you know, give a admonition or ammunition, it depends. <laughs> And, uh, and he told me, you seen, have you seen anybody fall out under the power? And I said, yes, yeah, some that was fake, some that was real. And he goes, well, God did a little bit more than that to our pastor. God started knocking him, knocking him down, and he was up on stage. He would get up, try to make his way to the, to the door. And God kept on knocking him down. When he got to the back door, he held on to the two handles and said, God, please stop. I'll quit mistreating your people. And God quit knocking him down. I said, what? <laughs> and he said, in the middle of the service, I said to myself, that's who I'm under? That God would take... Now, see, some people, especially some religious people, some religious pastors would hear the story and go, that never happened. Oh, it happened. The Lord used her to give him a public spanking. And he straightened right up after that. And that could happen to any one of us. So then I said, hmm, I think I'm going to study this leadership stuff a little bit more. <laughs> <laughs> it's what you call instant respect. Yep. Instant respect. Can you imagine that, guys? In the middle of a service. In the middle of a service. She was, a, she was a leader. She was a leader. So we have her picture back there. We don't worship her. You know. The Bible says to give honor to whom honor is due. You know how she passed away? You can tell I love her. She was in her bed. She couldn't do anything else. And she passed away ministering, making little cassette tapes because she had a pusher, as I called, you know, by then she had given me a little slack. <laughs> and I came in and she's reading into one of those little funny little recorders, just reading the Bible, making comments. And I go, what are you doing, Grandma? She goes, well, Jose, I still got a little bit of time here. Not much. She said, so I'm making tapes, and I got a guy down at the blind center that works at the blind center, and he's uh, passing these out among the blind people. And I said, you got a pusher. You got a dealer <laughs> down at the blind center. Yeah. She said, yep. Not the way I would have put it, but yes. And she passed away because yeah. she found a way mm -hmm. to pass away into the new life, ministering. Kick the devil in the chins as she is going out. Yep. Um, the if. Yeah, let's go to uh, 
to Ephesians uh, 4, 11 and 12. And he gave some apostles and some... Wow. Okay. Do you see that there's rankings? Mm -hmm. He's gonna give a lot of people get saved and they go, well, I'm a child of God. I can hear from God just as much as that person can. Really? You really think so? Take another lap around the mountain. Just hope it doesn't take 40 years. <laughs> Some people die in the wilderness. Mm -hmm. It's unfortunate, not God's will. Yeah. But they never enter into all the promises that God had for them and so forth. Mm -hmm. But I, go ahead and, and, and I want you to listen to this. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the what, work. Why? We call it the fivefold ministry. What is the purpose of the fivefold ministry? For the what? For the perfecting, perfecting of the saints. You notice the little word perfect? I needed perfection. That's why I was put with Lizzie Jasper. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So, so the fivefold ministry is for the what? Perfecting, Perfecting of the saints. So the saints could do the what? The work. Of the ministry. Not the, the great man or woman of God. Only they can do stuff. No. Mm -hmm. The job of the fivefold ministry is so the saints. Mm -hmm. Do you know what's supposed to be normal? These signs shall follow them that believe. Doesn't say apostle prophets. They'll lay hands upon the I mean all this stuff. All this stuff. For the perfecting of what? The saints. So you can go out and what? Do the work. And do the work. The Bible says this in the book of Acts. The Lord working with them, mm -hmm. confirming his word with signs and wonders and all kinds of stuff. You know what will happen? As we start to move into setting the house of God in his order. The saints become dangerous. Mm -hmm. When a demon comes across, across a disciple, they know that's a disciple. They know that that's not somebody that, well, you know, if we heard the will with little feelings, he'll just go <laughs> and leave the church. You don't have to wax and wash their car for them to show up for a Sunday service. Tell you something. When you run across somebody that's really demon-possessed, the first thing you're going to know is your position in Christ. You're going to find out if you're, if you've gone AWOL and you're trying to enforce authority over the opposing army. You're going to find out what your rank is real quick. A lot of people don't even believe in, in this stuff. They don't believe in deliverances. You know, they don't believe in dealing with demons or have to cast a demon out of somebody. Well, if you don't believe in it, that, you know, if you don't, uh, I, I like what this one uh, minister used to say. He's an older man now. And uh, I'll never forget this. He said, if you don't believe in casting them out, you believe in leaving them in. 
So if there's anybody watching out there, you know, you don't believe in, you know, you don't, we don't do that stuff. That means you believe in leaving them in. Because Jesus said they existed. Jesus said they had to be cast out. And if you don't, if you don't believe in it, it's not part of your doctrine. Your doctrine is you believe in leaving them in. Guys, I'm going to tell you something. The rank in God's army in his church is no different than the rank that God has in the angels. Do you guys know that angels have ranks? Archangels? There's ranks. There's ranks. And, you know, we as a church need to understand that there's ranks. Uh, I respect, you know, Bishop uh, Hammond. He's over me. And, uh, you know, Daryl Buck? Mm -hmm. You know, David Buck is his son. You know, he comes. Daryl, the older man, and um, I don't care what anybody thinks about this. When I'm around Daryl, and Daryl starts talking about the Lord, are you ready? I get off of my seat, and I sit on the floor, and I look up at him. I don't worship Daryl, but I don't know too many people that that have been thrown and beaten and uh, have gone through some of the stuff he's gone through for Christ. Where we couldn't find him, he disappeared. He was in another nation. Because they had secretly grabbed him. You know, like a movie? Thrown him in a little room and just messed with him and beat him. No bed. In a cubicle. You, do, do you guys know that I really like American Express? <laughs> you know how we were, you know how he was able to be located? There's a little thing that, you know, we all have. That's when we go overseas. Whenever we get to a location, we use the American Express. Because people can keep track of you. And the argument came up, uh, but wait a minute. He used his American Express. And American Express helped us. Particularly his son. And they said, well, he got on the airplane, but he never got here. Oh, no, he got there because he used his Federal Express. And when the embassy got involved and so forth, when he came back, we picked him up at the airport here. They had really done a lot of stuff to him. Had to be operated on. Now, do you understand why when he starts to talk to me, give me advice about things in the Lord? How I just sit on the floor and I look up at him? It's called respect. I do not worship him. But I give honor to whom honor is due. Because I don't know too many that have gone through stuff like he has. And that's just one thing. That's just one. Missing in action. By the grace of God, you know what would have happened to him? If it wasn't for the American Express contact? He's just gone. You know, in some countries you go, and uh, the government might not like you. So they, you'll just disappear. Well, what happened? Sometimes they'll just pay somebody to take care of the person. 
But anyway, um, you know, Bishop uh, and, uh, and Daryl, and then I have one more other person over me, Jim. And I honor and respect them. Yep. So, glory to God, honey, read that one more time. We're almost at the end here. Whoops. And he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Go ahead. When it says for the edifying of the body of Christ, that means the architectural structure. It doesn't mean just, hey, let me edify you and tell you how great you are. It's an architectural structure because we are being fitly framed and built up for a holy place, a temple of God. You know what the Bible says about the Apostle Paul? He was a master what? Builder. Master builder. He was building of the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. You know what I believe we're doing right now? Anybody ever heard of Frankenstein? <laughs> well, what happened is he took all these different parts and he made a body. <laughs> and the body was resurrected. I believe that. We are Satan's nightmare. I believe that we are the Lord's <laughs> Frankenstein. All these different bodies, parts put together, resurrected, because the Bible says, reckon yourself to be dead in Christ. And baptism represents what? Resurrection. Baptism rep represents your old life is buried, and now you what? New life. You are resurrected in new life. So we are the devil's nightmare. What we're doing here at my father's house is we're creating a Frankenstein. <laughs> Going, after the devil. Going after the devil. So, glory to God. Let's go to, uh, to Ephesians 4, verses uh, 13 through 16, and then we'll close. So this is Ephesians 4, verses 13 through 16. Till we all come in the unity of the faith. You know that we're just continuing. Mm -hmm. the edifying of the body of Christ. And now we're continuing. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and Time carried to grow about. Up with every wind of doctrine in the slate of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working in the measure of every part maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Can you read the last two verses and read them slow? But them speaking slow. the truth in love. Now, speaking the truth in love, I thank God for this mentor. She told me the truth in love. Yes. And look, she was more interested in me, be, me growing than she was me being a member of the church. Mm -hmm. Keep on going slow, honey. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things. So you guys are going to grow up 
in every area. Mm -hmm. Amen? Yes. Every area. Not just the areas that you want to grow in and not these other areas. <laughs> in all things. Which is the head, even Christ. He's the head of the body. Mm -hmm. From whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by. That which every joint supplieth. Stop. So every single one of you supply. Yeah. See how important that is? Mm -hmm. Can you read that again real slow? From whom the whole body fitly joined together. How does the Lord have the body joined together? Keep on reading. And compacted. And compacted. By that which every joint supplieth. Through the joint supplying. We supply. The compact. We all supply. There's something that you have that I don't have. There's something that he has that you don't have. And each part of the body supplies, supplies the creation of the body of Christ. It, it contributes. It contributes everyone. Mm -hmm. Did you get that? We all contribute. Is there to screws each other. Hold, holding up that sheet rock so it doesn't fall on your head? <laughs> yep. Well, why is this whole building here? Do you notice it's not just a pile of materials out there and say, well, the church. You know, the church can't say, hi, we're all here. No. And this is what we're doing now. There's a big difference in having this piece of property and having this whole building, all the material, piled up together. Mm -hmm. There's a difference in between that and having all the materials. Guess what? Supplying the screw, supplying the sheetrock to stay up. Yes. Got it? Yes. The cables, the wires supplying the breakers so the power can flow through each part of this building. The light bulbs. Mm -hmm. So the power, the electricity can come through. Did you see? You know what I'm talking about, huh? Mm-hmm. The plumbing so the water can flow, so the water doesn't stay out there on the street. That's how important we are to one another. So don't ever forget this. How good would my father's house building be if it was just a pile of material? We got all the material. Oh, we have wonderful gifts here. Oh, yes, <laughs> we have it all. But there's a structure. You read the plans. This is what we're doing. Mm -hmm. We're taking all the parts and putting it at the right place. Each part is supplying. Boom. So we can have a Frankenstein to go after the, the hurts and everything that's happening in Las Vegas and bring healing. Wait till... We tell you guys, wait till the blessing comes. And don't forget this Sunday. Are you ready? Very important message. Not to self-seeking Christians. They, this wouldn't be appealed too much to them. But we're going to read about, we're going to bring a message on the two most important beggars in the Bible. Two beggars. There's more. Maybe we'll get a chance to talk about three, but famous beggars in the Bible. They were powerful. Powerful. God bless you. Those of you that are watching, May the Holy Spirit haunt you with his peace 
and his power. Amen.